couple of years ago, I was watching a, a football game. You know how it goes, it's not all that exciting, but towards the end it became really exciting and I was getting into it, home team trying to score a goal. I wanted a beer, but I didn't want to leave the screen to go to the kitchen. And then I thought, how convenient it would be to have a beer robot. <laughs> you know, this little fridge on wheels that would come in, I would just call out, get me a beer, and then it would come. But then it dawned on me, uh, what if it would come in and would say, you're not getting another one because you had enough beer already? <laughs> Excuse me. But maybe uh, my wife programmed it. <laughs> she knows me. <laughs> or maybe my doctor. <clears throat> you know. Or maybe, maybe my health insurance company. Or my employer. So all of a sudden, I wasn't quite sure about how convenient this robotic future of ours was uh, going to be. And at the same time, it's clear that robots will come into our houses. They will be in our living rooms, they will be in our kitchens, kitchens they will be in our gardens and in our beds. Uh, and the reasons for this are actually quite simple. First of all, technically, they become really much better. Better sensors, better observation, better motors, more motoric capacities, uh, more processing speed, so they will learn very quickly. But most of all, the most important reason that robots will be in our homes is a very mundane one. Uh, they will become cheaper. The price goes down. Five, seven years ago at my Department of Artificial Intelligence at the Radboud University of Nijmegen, we bought the NAO, one of those robots you see everywhere, and we had to pay well over 10,000 euro. Last year we bought one, it was below 5,000. If that development continues, then pretty soon there will be around six, seven, eight hundred euros. And then you can buy a nice robot at the price of a TV or a refrigerator. And then people will start buying them. And when people start buying, there will be a market, so there will be better robots, better products, and then it will go fast. And all, more or less the same will happen as what happened in the 80s with the personal computer. At the beginning, no one had a computer. Then the Commodore 64 appeared, and we started buying these things. I remember programming my first basic program on Commodore 64. <laughs> <laughs> With a little tape, you know, it was, the memory was just beautiful. And within 10 years, almost every household had a computer. So we can expect something similar like that to happen within maybe 5, 10, 15 years, who knows. Now, that's where the challenges begin. Because first of all, robots and artificial intelligence in general is this weird combination of smartness, superhuman intelligence, and incredible stupidity. They can beat us at chess. They can beat us at Go. They're incredible in analyzing huge amount of data and finding patterns that would be invisible to us. At the same time, they're not very good in common sense, just understanding what the situation is all about. They have no social intelligence, no empathy. So they're going to be really different from us, and we will have to deal with this weird combination of superintelligence and stupor stupidity. And that's going to show, for instance, when we give them instructions, and they will follow it literally, instead of thinking about what we actually mean when we give them those instructions. Or they won't be that easily able to make exceptions to the rule. You know, it's a football game, beer. Well, this is just, you know, a normal competition game, so... But, okay, this is the final for the Champions League, so yeah, there's an exception. Well, if you ask me, okay, that's... <laughs> so... Another challenge would be that different generations might be affected differently by robots. And they will have different values, different expectations, different hopes or fears in relation to robots. So imagine, for instance, this young kid, five, six year old, and he or she will be growing up with a robot friend. And this robot friend will always be supportive, play the games that the guy, uh, the, the, the child wants or the girl wants. Uh, you know, if there's something to comfort, the robot will always be there. It will be a perfect friend. That's great. But I grew up with a brother and a sister. 
Now, don't get me wrong, they were great, and they still are, and I love them dearly, but they never wanted to play the games that I wanted to play. And if I wanted to play with a toy, then especially my little brother, who was much faster than me, would always get it first. But these little frictions actually helped me to develop my social skills. You know, they prepared me for later at school, or at work, or in society at large, to deal with situations that would require some negotiation, for instance. So how certain are we that the social development of infants will really be supported by robot friends? It's a big topic. Another topic is, for instance, the likes or the dislikes that people have. Now, my mother, she's 87, she's doing very well, but she needs increasingly some support. She would be absolutely horrified by the idea of having a robot in her house helping her out. She would feel socially isolated, neglected to be supported by a thing. But there's other possibilities here too. So at one time I gave a lecture in uh, Nijmegen at the library. There was a young woman or somewhere in her 20s in a wheelchair. And afterwards, she came to me and she said, well, you know, when I have to take a bath, I need assistance. But I don't want these caregivers to see me like this, naked in the bathtub. For me, a robot would be nicely impersonal. It would, you know, protect my privacy much better than could be done with, with people. So you can see that there's all these kinds of different questions about what we want and why with robots in the near future. Um, and there's an additional point, uh, maybe the biggest challenge of all, that we not often realize except on days like today, and that's generations mix all the time. Take a simple house situation at home, you know, you have parents, you have the kids, you have the grandparents visiting, and while we're interacting during those situations, we do that with enormous grace and ease. You talk to a child, and you talk slightly differently than you do to an adult. Maybe slightly more simple, slightly more cheerful, with an adult you're more, uh, let's say, uh, business-like. Then with someone with a beginning dementia, you also talk more simple, but not in the same way that you did to the child. Maybe out of respect for greater wisdom, etc. So we adapt to this mix of generations very fluently, almost automatically, without thinking. So how are we going to prepare our robots to deal with those kind of mixed situations? It's very clear that the situation is going to be, require a lot of subtlety, and we don't even understand very well the mechanisms operative in us. It's not going to be a one-size-fits-all kind of solution. When I think about this, uh, and I, I teach uh, to my students, you know, we have in the AI department at Nijmegen around 180 new students coming in uh, every year, and they are learning to develop the technology for the next decade. It's that generation, they're always between 20 and 24, more or less. I get older every year, my students stay exactly the same age all the time, I don't know how... <laughs> become harder and harder. Uh, but they will develop this new technology. And for them, it's kind of easy. They're among the early adopters of the technology. They have the latest you know, gadgets and stuff, and they're the easy adapters to it. They don't need to read a manual. You don't even have manuals any, anymore because they don't require them. It's like they were born knowing what the buttons do and everything. I have to study. They don't. But their products will work for people of other generations too. And so the big challenge, for instance, for me and my colleagues at the AI department, is how to prepare them for that difference in perspective that they need to take in order to develop the right kind of products. The robots that will fit the kind of values, the expectations, or the hopes of the fears or different generations. Now, in design, there's this beautiful tool that's been developed for, for people that make all kinds of, uh, let's say, simple products. Uh, it's called the uh, old age suit, for instance. I'm not sure if you've ever seen them, but they use this for students to get a feel of the perspective of the older generation. Uh, I don't want to make you depressed, but let me summarize this. So you get goggles that block your view a little bit, so you see worse. 
You get earphones that muffle the sound so you hear less. There's this kneecap that makes you not able to bend your knee, so you have to, you know, walk. <laughs> Excuse me for saying this. Uh, but this is fine for, let's say, physical understanding, the understanding of the physical situation that maybe elderly generations uh, encounter. But we don't have anything like a cognitive old age suit. Exactly how do you prepare students for, let's say, the smaller periods of concentration that you can achieve when you get a little bit older? Or maybe the deeper understanding of the motivation of people behind their actions due to your longer life experience and your greater wisdom. That's also a cognitive difference. Although my students, of course, would not be willing to acknowledge this very easily. The same goes for a cognitive suit for very young children. We've all been six or seven years old, but do we really remember how we perceive the world in those days? So one of the biggest challenges actually in robotics these days for the kind of problems that I just mentioned is how to prepare this new generation of developers for the difference in perspective. And well, what I suggest to them and my colleagues do too is there's only one way, discuss it. Talk to your parents, to your grandparents, Ask them how they like the technology, what they don't like about the technology, what they don't like about the implications of the technology, what they are afraid of, what they would prefer. Ask them. Don't think for the other generations. Just ask them. So in a way, robotics makes us understand the, 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 the beauty and the difficulty of this enormous generation mix in which we find ourselves. And it's by producing these machines that are not capable of doing what we do that we learn to appreciate ourselves actually more. We see by building models in robotics the limitations of our own understanding. So as we were here, I think today on stage and, 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 and you in the audience, uh, we adapt to each other, to members of different generations, which is great, great ease and uh, a facility. Um, robotics makes us understand how complex this is, but also how valuable, and most of all, how beautiful this generation mix is. Thank you very much.